right, I'm going to call to order the Wednesday, September 28th meeting of the Wilmington School Committee. If you could start by joining me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, first item on our agenda is our items by consent. And I think I'll cover the ones that we can all vote on first. Uh, that being item A, approval of minutes from September 14th. Warrants G400, G401, G402, R200, R201, LO1, LO2, LO3, LO4, LO5, LO6, LO7. Uh, skipping down to warrants FS04. I'll take a motion to approve. Mrs. Bonish. Second. Mr. Talbot. Second. All those in favor? I think we've got everybody. Thank you. Okay, and then we have item C, which is the warrant CB01. I'll take a motion to approve item CB01. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Second. Kane. Mr. Talbot, Thank second. You. All those in favor? Okay. One abstain. Mrs. Burns. And item number D, SPED 01 and SPED 02. I'll take a motion to approve. Mrs. Bonish, a second. Mr. Mulis, thank you. All those in favor? Okay, we've got one abstain. Excellent. Okay, I think that covers the items for consensus. Moving right along to superintendent's report, please. <coughs> yes, I have a couple of, um, I guess, happy announcements to make, and I'd like to start by recognizing uh, Mrs. Doreen Crow. Uh, I received a, um, a letter um, this past week announcing that Mrs. Crow has been named the Massachusetts School Nurse Administrator of the Year uh, for 2016-2017 by the Massachusetts School, School Nurse uh, Organization. So we're really thrilled. Uh, this was She was nominated by her colleague, uh, Mrs. Jane Ferrara, and uh, we're very happy that uh, Jane... Um, nominated her and she wrote a very nice and compelling application which led them to award her this. She will be awarded the actual award on October 15th at the uh, MSNO's fall conference uh, which I am planning to attend to witness the honor. So That's congratulations great. to Mrs. Crow. Uh, another piece of good news that we have is that we actually have um, some students who have progressed pretty far along in the 2017 National Merit Scholarship Program. Uh, Anna <coughs> Dela Cruz has been named a 2017 National Merit Scholarship Program commended student. Uh, and in addition, we also have a, um, so uh, actually I'll read the statement, I think, from uh, Ms. Ms. Peters uh, re with respect to Anna Dela Cruz. Uh, so, Ms. Peters announced today that Anna de la Cruz, a member of the class of 2017, has been named a commended student in the 2017 National Merit Scholarship Program. A letter of commendation from the school and the National Merit Corporation, which conducts the program, was presented to Anna by Ms. Peters and her guidance counselor, Mrs. Jessica Rugo. Anna is an excellent citizen of Wilmington High School. She's a mature, polite, and, and kind. She is mature, polite, and kind to everyone. Strong across the disciplines, Anna has enrolled in a rigorous honors and advanced placement curriculum and is at the top of her class. Outside the classroom, Anna has a myriad of talents and interests. She is a talented athlete and a member of our track and field and cross country teams. She is also a member of Model UN, Mentor Club, and the National Honor Society. She hopes to study veterinary medicine in college. About 34,000 commended students throughout the nation are being recognized for their exceptional academic promise. Commended students place among the top 5% of more than 1.6 million students who entered the 2000. 17 competition by taking the preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship qualifying test. So we 
congratulate Anna on this accomplishment. In addition, I also learned that uh, we have a student, Kira Kiria Nelson, who is a semifinalist in the National Merit Scholarship Program. Uh, she is one of 16,000 semifinalists in the 62nd Annual National Merit Program. She has the opportunity to continue on in the competition for one of the 7,500 National Merit Scholarships that will be announced in the spring of 2017. So congratulations to Kira as well, and we look forward to following her progress That's in this. That's awesome. And finally, uh, we, as you know, uh, this on Monday uh, at 4.30 p.m., the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education lifted the embargo on the 2016 spring MCAS uh, administration test results as well as accountability levels, and we're very pleased to announce that the Woburn Street School and the North Intermediate School have both achieved level one status, making them amongst the highest performing schools in the Commonwealth. More information on our MCAS and accountability will be forthcoming in the month of October as we do our annual performance assessment and accountability reports. Wonderful. Yes. Happy to share that good news, and that concludes my report. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I don't think we have any old business. So under new business, the first item is the 2016-2017 ELL program plan. Yes, each year, about this time of the year, we present to you the English Language Learner Program Plan for the academic year. Uh, tonight we have with us Sue McDonald, who is our ELL uh, curriculum team leader, as well as one of the ELL teachers in the district, and also um, Mrs. Jen Mahan, who is the uh, Interim Director of Student Support Services, the umbrella under which our ELL program falls. So. Um, you have the plan in front of you. Uh, we have no formal presentation, but intended to take any questions that members might have with respect to the program plan. Great. Any questions or comments on the yellow? Mrs. Keene. Um, I just had a question on the um, page five, the first page. It says that Wilmington meets the mandates of questions two and no child left behind. I wasn't sure what question two they're referring to. Okay, thank you. I wasn't sure if it was question two we have on the ballot now. It was like, what? Right. What's that doing there? <laughs> yeah, thank you. And can I just make one more comment that um, it's good for people to know within the school and without that this is a mandate, government mandated. So it's not something we think up to do to add to our teachers' burdens of what they're trying to learn. Um, it has to do with what they're, they're supposed to be learning from the state. Any other questions, Mr. Mules? How many um, yellow students do we have now in the district? So right now, we're still in the middle of testing kindergarten, but at the moment, it's just about 30. We had 34 last year, and we exited the, we exited about 10 or 12 from the program because they were ready to exit. They test scored out. But we have had about seven or eight, almost 10 students come back in, and we're, I've got two of them coming into the high school like starting in a week or so. Um, and like I said, we're still doing kindergarten. We have, um, we don't like to test kindergarten students right away because they just started school. So we give them a few weeks and so. Uh, and so are these 30 the same, part of the same students from last year? Or are some they new? Are. Some of them are. We, we exited about 12 of them. And now we have at least 10 that have come back. When you say exit, what, did, what does that okay, mean? Okay, so exit, what happens is the students are usually with us for about three to four years, depending on the growth of their proficiency level. And that's assessed every year in January. <coughs> the test called the ACCESS. It's, uh, it's just like the MCAS, similar in structure. And so it determines the, the language proficiency of the ELL students. When they get to a level five or 5.0 and higher, then it's time for them to be exited. We also look at MCAS scores, check their grades in the classroom to make sure they're ready. But what that entails is that we do send the information home to the parents, and then as ESL teachers, we have to follow those students for two years 
to make sure they're still making academic progress in class. Now with the new ESA, that's going to be four years we have to follow them. That's one of the changes. So I can safely say about right now about 30 students, but you know about... Do we have a range of languages for it? Uh, yes, they're all over the place. No, so, last year there was some that I didn't even yes, recognize. So I just in my high school class here this year, I have Spanish, Swahili, Italian, and I'm going to have Portuguese and Filipino. And that's just the one class here. So yes, we do have more Spanish-speaking um, home languages right now, but when I say more, probably like six or seven out of the 30 is there is there's, there's, there's a range. Yeah, and we do have our first family that we would consider refugee family this year. So that's that's been. Um, a challenge, but an interesting, it's an interesting situation. Everyone's working wonderfully with these students, but you know, they were, um, they didn't have, they were in school for quite a few years. So they're actually called SLIFES. <laughs> students with limited or interrupted formal education. And this is Wilmington's first case of this. So we work with the family, the foster family, the you know, Department of Human Services, Department of Ed too try to make all, find all the pieces so what's missing, and then uh, I work with the teachers, and yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay, great. The next item on our agenda is the 2016-2017 District Curriculum Accommodation Plan, otherwise known as the DCAP. Yes, and uh, just by way of introduction, again, this is something that we bring to the committee. Uh, and that we make available as we do with the ELL program plan on our website so that our parents and families are, understand what is available to them as either English language learner families or what is available through them through the district curriculum accommodation plan. So I'm going to actually turn it over to Mr. Gallagher and uh, Mrs. Ippolito is also here. The two of them, of them have spearheaded the um, finalization of the 2016-17 plan after much work by a, a small group that spent some time over the last couple of years updating and revising this. But uh, um, not sure if you want to just make some general comments, but I know you had there might be some questions as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to thank uh, Lisa Polito for all of her hard work uh, coming into the district in August. This is, you know, a uh, one of the aspects of a effective district, and I think she really pulled everything together and looked at some of the revisions. And um, so I want to compliment her for all her work, and especially over the summer, and helping me out with my transition. So I'm still, she's still thinking about <coughs> my accommodations here. So. Um, but no, I, I think one of the big pieces, from my understanding, is the streamlining, the streamlining of the ISD team and all of those forms that were in the back, so now we have one form that all schools will be utilizing. I think one of the other big aspects, and it's going to really help, I think the uh, teachers is really outlining the accommodations in the classroom and the instructional strategies that we plan on working with the faculty in, in different departments to kind of help them with some of those instructional strategies, um, which ultimately is monitoring the academic progress of our students and trying to uh, utilize these mainstream uh, accommodations first, exhausting all of that, uh, trying to help our students make academic progress. So I think from the, it was a, a committee that was set up in the past, I think they, they did some you know, great work and you know, like all documents sometimes, the same document gets handed down every year. So I think one of our goals is to retype uh, the entire document once it's approved and then that way we have a clean copy going into next year so you don't have, you know, different programming, you know, like Word from like 1997's in here somewhere and it, you know, throws the format off. So um, that, that's about it. Just wanted to thank uh, the people that worked on it. It's a pretty good document. Great. Any questions? Mrs. Kane. I just ask, I know this is me not knowing this, but why did we get, um, did something change in the two documents? 
we got another one tonight and we had already well, had one. We in found actually uh, Mrs. Burns had uh, identified some er some typographical errors questions. which had been mm -hmm. corrected. So we've oh, got okay. those corrections. So it's the list of questions you had sent to us. Up, yeah. Correct. Okay, thank it's you. The okay. Any other, Mrs. Burns? I, I just want to say that I what I like about it most of all is that it's put in such a clear format that you really, no one, even different perspective, when you read it, it's very clearly planned out what needs to be done and the steps to take that. And I think that's a huge benefit to um, to this plan um, with regards to how it reads to a, a vast majority of educators and administrators. And I, I commend you on that because someone like a layman like myself, I do appreciate the, um, the simplicity in the sense that so easily understood. Thank you. I just add for the couple of us that have um, had prior experiences in other districts, I think that uh, Wilmington is on the forefront. There are many districts that, even though it's required, don't even have a, a DCAP, and nor does anyone know perhaps what a DCAP is. Um, and if they have one, sometimes it becomes a document that sits on a shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say here in Wilmington, it is a very live. It's very much a living document. Uh, administrators, school building principals at the beginning of each year remind folks that we have a DCAP and, and our, our job, and I think, you know, um, certainly Mr. Yaller is going to take the lead in this, is making sure in particular that all the list of accommodations are things that all educators are aware of, and these are the interventions that we utilize uh, as part of trying to provide service in the regular education classroom as much as possible, meet the needs of students prior to even considering whether evaluation or referral is necessary. It's a strong list of accommodations, and I think if implemented properly, will really help to maximize our ability to maintain kids in the general education setting. So I think, uh, like I said, our, our school district does a really nice job with this, with this plan. Great. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next item of business is the fiscal year 18 budget calendar. I can't believe I just said fiscal year 18. Uh, this is probably for Paul or Mr. Ruggiero the worst time of the year. He's <laughs> still trying to close and report on 16 while managing and balancing 17 while thinking about launching into fiscal year 18. Uh, it's very challenging at this time of year, so I commend him for being able to keep his wits about him, let alone the organization that goes into this. So uh, I thank him for putting together this draft schedule uh, for your review. And um, you know, if anybody has any questions in terms of the schedule, um, Paul, I don't know if you want to point out anything in particular. Thank you. Um, the schedule is similar to what you've seen in the past. A um, couple changes we did. Instead of having our marathon day where we meet with all the budget um, managers, we broke it up into a couple of mornings. Um, in December, December 7th meeting, uh, we'll, the superintendent will give you a preliminary budget, kind of where we are right now, not a full-blown presentation, but kind of where we are. Um, in January is when we'll present the, the rec superintendent's recommended budget of the, the budget book and so forth. That's kind of our, our goal. Um, the public hearing on the budget will be in February, similar to what it has been in the past. In March, we'll meet with the Finance Committee. Don't have a date yet for that. <coughs> and in town meeting uh, to hopefully approve the, the budget is uh, April 29th. Um, those dates that aren't put in, like the public hearing for February 8th, are those like set in stone, like the, that they're in the book kind of thing, or will they, the, the they do they 8th, fluctuate at all? Um, yeah, February 8th is, is essentially the same time in the calendar that we did it last year. Oh, okay. We did it, whatever it was, February 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, whatever, however, wherever it fell in that, uh, the first right. meeting Just to hit the, uh, the calendar so I don't yeah. keep it all on. <laughs> yeah, you can mark that one down. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Pen? <laughs> Um, <laughs> never been, right? <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions or comments regarding the fiscal year 18 budget schedule? It always looks a little overwhelming to me, so I'm glad that somebody else put together the schedule. Okay. 
Great. Our next item of business is a presentation, and I'm going to mess up the pronunciation here. Educatus? Educatius. Educatius. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and um, Mr. Gallagher, Gallagher will be giving you a presentation. I just wanted to offer as an introductory remarks that last year uh, we had a student here at Wilmington High School from Germany, and it came about through an interesting set of circumstances. Uh, we had a family in Wilmington whose daughter was placed with a family in Germany, and that family's daughter was placed with a family in, I believe it was Kentucky, and she was not having a great experience in the school she was in, and the family from Wilmington contacted us and asked if there was any way that we would take their daughter. So it was kind of it's true exchange. Um, and the young lady's name was uh, Lou um, Schramm, and she came here to the high school. She had a wonderful experience. She came to me at the end of the year. Uh, she had been named, I think, twice, had student of the, received the Student of the Month Award, and she actually played on the tennis team and went to the States. And uh, Mr. Hackett, Coach Hackett, had shared with me that it was the first time in many, many years that he had one of his players go to the state tournament. And she came to me at the end of the year to share with me the incredible experience she had here in Wilmington and her <coughs> enthusiasm for coming back someday and maybe attending an American university. Uh, and at that point in time, I thought to myself, we need to create opportunities for more students to come from abroad and come to Wilmington High School so that we can expose them and expose our students to some cultural diversity and, and share the opportunities that Wilmington has to offer and Wilmington High School has to offer. So uh, in, in walks Mr. Gallagher, and uh, he has uh, done work with Educatius in his time at Beverly High School, some fantastic work. And he uh, brought Mr. Jenkins, Steve Jenkins, in to meet with me to explain and talk all about Educatius. Uh, and I was sold. I think this is exactly the thing that I had envisioned that we would want to do to be able to bring those students here to Wilmington. So we wanted to give you an overview uh, of what Educatius is all about. Um, it is. If we were to proceed, there would be a minimal amount of investment, and Sean will talk about that a little bit more. Um, but I, I was wanting him to share all that he knows and his experience with the program. So I'll turn it over to yeah. I, I also I have um, just to hand out a, a couple uh, schedules of current students, not in Wilmington Public Schools, but in my previous district. Um, so you can kind of that's just a sample of two seniors and a junior some of the courses um, that they're taking. So first of all, I agree 100%. I think um, an exchange program uh, brings a lot of diversity within uh, the community. From my past experience, a lot of our, uh, we've had this program up and running in my previous district for six years. It's been extremely successful. Um, a lot of the students get involved in athletics, they get involved in theater, they get involved in art. Um, and it's, it's just the connections between the students is, is truly incredible. So um, it's, it's worth it, I think, in, in all the different areas. So I'll walk you through kind of uh, the educatious, educational program and, and kind of what it has to offer and all the checks and balances within an exchange program, this one, um, that I think you'll, you'll appreciate. So first of all, Educatious International, um, they have the representation over 50 different countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Italy, China, Korea, just to name a few. Uh, and what's really nice about the education staff that works um, with the, the Boston and, and throughout the United States is they've all experienced the, the program themselves. They're either host families themselves or they were coordinators. So they really understand all of the people that we would be working with um, they understand how the program works. And it's all about developing relationships with the district, with the families, and uh, with the school system. So um, they, they've done a nice job. And they actually reach out to a lot of educators, um, you know, retired educators to help out with the program. Um, so it's really academically driven. Just some more information. Um, it's a conglomerate of eight businesses, charitable and environmental organizations, 30 offices in 14 different countries, and 28 cities. So for the past 10 years, this program is really growing. 
Um, and one of the big reasons, it's run through Homeland Security. Um, and when we get into the different types of visas, I'll explain that uh, to everybody. But all of the students in uh, this educational exchange program is run through Homeland Security and the SEVIS program, um, which really uh, checks all the uh, checks and balances um, with, with the students that are coming over. And, and the, it's the cream of the crop that's coming over through this program. Um, you know, once again, they uh, have, what's really nice about the Boston area is they have a headquarters in Boston. So if there's any issues or, or whatever, they, they would drive out and, and meet with us. You know, if there's uh, education students in Texas, then they don't have a central location. So this is being funded um, or founded right out of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so um, that's that, that slide there. All right. So here's just some background on education. So they've been uh, working this program for the past 10 years. They have 100 boarding schools that they work with, 150 private day schools, 150 public high schools, districts, and over 100 private and public colleges and universities. So that's throughout the country. Um, every year they're uh, placing over 8,000 students from all over the world attending the United States schools and universities. And then the uh, education offers free consulting and support schools need to go through the SEVIS certification. That's what we'll talk about next. Just to kind of give you an overview of what SEVIS is and the Homeland Security piece, um, especially with, unfortunately, the way the world is today, um, there's a lot of, uh, as I said before, checks and balances. This exchange program, when we were moving forward as a district, looking at this, this is the piece that we really liked in the sense that um, all of the students and all the families in this entire education exchange program is run through Homeland Security. Um, in public schools, these exchange students will stay for 10 months with the host family, um, and then they would go back um, you know, to, to their home country. The private schools, they don't have uh, as such a regulation, so a private school, the student could do a four years at you know at the private school, so they can stay multiple years in a private school. Public school, they stay ten months. We geared um, our uh, program for juniors and seniors, um, and what we found over the past six years, um, especially here in this this great district, you have a, a brand new high school. It's very close uh, to the Boston area, and some great universities and colleges. So uh, if we decide to move forward, that would be a big selling point um, in the program. They would really like this district for, for everything that we have to offer, all the extracurricular activities, uh, beautiful school, uh, uh, new high school, and a great um, school district, and so close to Boston. So um, I don't think we would have any problems um, you know, acquiring students who would like to come to Wilmington. So the education coordinator's <coughs> responsibilities, remember a lot of the um, people that are working are the um, educationists are former uh, educators. Um, so they really wanna make a connection with the school and the school district. That's really, really important to them. And um, they assist with the, um, the whole process that I'll outline in a minute from interviewing families and checking uh, the home sites and working with the home families and getting approval uh, with the approved families and, and the host families. And they really build the relationship and they pride themselves being face-to-face. Uh, -face. And once again, having the headquarters in Boston is, um, is just an extra bonus. And Mr. Jenkins, who is like the, uh, one of the regional directors, is a former superintendent. Um, he retired out of Winthrop, so he really understands how schools operate, and, um, and that's, a, that's a great benefit. So when we're looking at the exchange students, here's just an overall general view of um, when, you, when we, we receive students. It's based on their academics. The district uh, can set the bar on the language abilities, on, uh, on the English proficiency. Um, 
very uh, you know motivated students. They have full medical insurance and, and all of that, so that's nothing that the um, district would have to pick up. The international coordinator, they go out to the community, they, they screen and work with the host families, and they provide ongoing support for the students. Um, as I said before, in a public high school, it's a 10 month or one academic year for <coughs> one visa. Um, and as I said before, in a private school, they could attend for uh, multiple years. Um, students attend uh, the orientation both in their country and then when they arrive to the United States. So there's orientations on both. And then students are required to maintain a C average in every class. Um, so they have to um, do well academically. Um, and that's the other nice piece about running through Homeland Security, some exchange programs. If, if you have a student that you know, wasn't a good match or was misbehaving a lot, there's a lot of kind of red tape that in other exchange programs um, here, and I've never experienced it, but if you did have a bad match or something did happen, you would get on, get on the phone and Homeland <laughs> Security, they don't, they don't waste time. So that student would, would be sent back and that's all part of the agreement um, with the families um, you know, as they come here. They have to be role models, they have to be great uh, academic, make academic progress and, and great citizens of the school. That is the ultimate uh, goal. And in my uh, previous experience, I've never um, experienced any students that didn't really hold a high bar um, with this program. So for them, basically, uh, it's a step one, uh, just they review in the school selection. So if we were to move forward, we would have a profile, Wilmington, uh, high School, Wilmington Public Schools, the students, uh, it would go into the Educatius uh, catalog, the students would look at that, they would, you know, peak interest, um, and then they would inquire through Educatius about Wilmington. Um, the school selection, the, the, the student would choose the district, they would set up the, you know, a pre-application together with the transcripts and the English test scores required. So in that profile, you can determine uh, the English proficiency, um, which is pretty good. And then from there, uh, once they, the availability, so if we have slots, then they would start that process. Uh, step two, you'd have an application and the acceptance. On the application, it's reviewed by education. <coughs> Additional questions may be asked, confirmation details. A lot of times, if we are going to be taking a student in, you would Skype with that student, um, and you would ask them, they give you questions, and you can, it, it's, it's pretty neat, um, because usually you have the whole family um, with the parents and siblings, and, the, and they're all excited. So the Skyping, I would recommend, um, especially for the host families. Um, so that's, that's a great aspect of this program. And then a school official, uh, there'll be designated people working as um, you know, the gatekeeper of this program. We would accept the students uh, and then uh, via email and then the invoice would be issued. So this uh, is an I-20 process, um, which is basically the I-20 process. We become an I-20 school, which means we can give the F-1 visas um, acceptance so that's the, the process that we would have to do uh, it's a one and I'll get to the, the, the fee but it's a one-time uh, process application process and once you're in I-20 school you're always in I-20 school um, and being in I-20 elevates um, the visa towards the homeland security there's different types of visas um, that are, uh, people can apply for so the host family um, placement the placement information is finalized by uh, Educatius and the details that are sent online and then the student receives the visa, the travel itinerary, the entered into the online system and they're ready to go. So with that being said, that's kind of like the whole process in a nutshell, in a 15 minute um, presentation. But here's, here's what we would need to do for the next steps to move forward. This whole process to become approved takes approximately 
uh, I would say a year or six to 12 months um, to get the whole process approved. The beginning is what we would like to do is the I-17 application and that's something the district would do to become an I-20 school. That's the first step. Um, the cost of the application is a one-time fee of $1,700 and that begins the application process for 2016. Then the education representatives would come out to Wilmington, they would tour the school, they would meet with a lot of different people, and that's a one-time fee of $650. And then the total uh, fee is $2,350, one-time fee, when you combine those. So the creation of the Wilmington High School profile, that's all part of that too. Um, we would do that, they would advertise that, they would help us with that. and. Um, so that's, that's the next step. So this first two steps, you're probably talking springtime going into next year. That would be the, the goal uh, if we do move forward to have, have the ability to take students in for next year. Um, let me just go back to this piece. So because this program is run through Homeland Security, it's a little bit different than uh, having um, school exchange programs. So the host families, the benefit for the host families, if they host a student, exchange student, um, they receive a monthly stipend of $700 a month um, to help support for the food, the travel, and all of that. Um, for the district, uh, educatious and the students that come into Wilmington uh, public schools, they would uh, be the same uh, pure pupil expenditure. So right now it's $15,000. Um, that, if they came to Wilmington Public Schools, so they're not taking resources, they would pay for those resources to uh, be part of our, just like everyone else would be part of our uh, school system. So, um, you know, if we're looking at 10 students, it's kind of would be the goal, or five students, um, you know, so that pure pupil expenditure would come into the district. Um, and then the benefit for the Wilmington families that would like to host an exchange student for 10 months is you receive a monthly stipend to support uh, the student. So you're not, it's not a burden on, on a family that would really want to be part of that. Um, so that's, that's the program. Uh, if any, anybody has any questions or, yes. Um. Did you do this in Beverly? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. And um, what is the, uh, so you said the goal is between five and ten kids? It, and, you, it, you know, for when we started, um, when we walked into that uh, the first year, mm -hmm. uh, we, we started off small with five. Mm -hmm. But we could have, we accommodated ten the following year, and then I believe we're up to twelve to fifteen. Uh, but it depends on the uh, class sizes and how much room you may have. So we <coughs> give it to the upper classmen, to seniors, exchange students that are seniors. Um, and that's worked out pretty well. Sometimes a junior will take on juniors too. Um, and I checked with uh, the high school administration, so there would be room for five to ten very comfortably. Um, class sizes here, I think the average is 19. So if you had ten seniors, you know, scattered throughout all those classes that shouldn't have an impact on. And if you look at their, the classes they're selecting, it's typically a higher level AP honors type of student that you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And then one more. Um, sure. Is it, so would people come for the full 10 months or can you do a half a year? Did you, you can do a half a year. Uh, some districts do a half a year, but I think for, for the families and for the whole experience, we never did the, the half a year mm -hmm. piece. We did the full year mm -hmm. um, for the and 10 months. So they would stay like for the holidays? And stuff. They do. Sometimes they go back, they go back um, you know, and some of our students will go back with them. So they develop the connection. We've had students, you know, Germany, Brazil, Italy, which isn't a bad, <laughs> not a bad uh, <laughs> vacation, you know. Um, but so th that's, that's the thing that, I know. I mean, there's, you know, there's some benefits all around, but when you see the connections of the students, we had a lot of our students get involved um, in, in the after school activities. We, we had um, some Brazilian students that were the leads in our musical 
We had uh, tennis players that you know won the state title uh, coming from Sweden, um, and they they're able to participate in all extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. So they really get the full, and they become part of the culture of the school, which is, and what that also has done uh, for the our the, the students in Beverly is there's an exchange, a rotary exchange program. So a lot of our students would get into um, school, but they would defer for a year to go abroad because they met, they saw that connection. So we had more and more seniors deferring college for a year to go study abroad and then they come back. Um, it just, it's pretty good. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Mr. Talbot. Um, so does the host family have to live in Wilmington? Not necessarily, no. Nope. So what you'll have is a region, we'll have one of the coordinators that would be working in this area. So sometimes it's neighboring, like you know, North Reading, Reading. Green, yes, like for us it wasn't just Beverly, it was Swamp Scott or Danvers. Okay. So they find the host families. Yeah, because I was just wondering if, if they don't, you know, if we can get 10 families to, sure. to do this, you know, what would happen to the student if, you know, if, that, if they couldn't find a town, or if the family had to move, let's say, to somewhere else. Right. It? Sometimes is uh, you do, you move, uh, I mean, if it, for some reason if it didn't work, like the, the family and the, the exchange, you, you could move them to another family. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what ends up happening is you have a network, the regional person that would be working with host families, there's a network of host families. And that's the other piece, it brings families together. So in the area, they'll have different events for the host families and the exchange students, and then all of the um, people get together. It's, there's a lot of great benefits to it. Actually, just one more question. Is sure. this available to people in America? This, or is it just bringing, you know? Like for American students to go? Go uh, over like Germany, and, and I know there's exchange programs, but right. I'm wondering if this particular program if they sit on the off, like a reverse? Yeah, like a reverse. Yeah, I'm, I think they're bringing, this education is bringing them here, but there are other programs that do. Uh, especially, in, I, I know in the college, you know, as, as I'm going through the college process with my daughter, that's like her number one thing. She wants, does this college have an exchange program? Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's like something that I never would have thought of going as I'm selecting schools, but it's, yeah. Mr. Mulis. The host families, how are they chosen? Is there a vetting process? Is there certain requirements? How, how does that work? Yeah, so, so if we, um, we would post that out, we would publicize, you know, we're looking for host families. We would show all the, you know, the, the benefits to hosting an exchange student. Um, yeah, and then there would be, you know, interviews and, and quarry checks and all that, because, um, and that's something educatious would take care of. Um, doing a you know home visit. That's, that's part of my question. Is it something that the school system does, or, yeah. or? no? They they would take care of all of that. So we would provide a lot of um, some staff would want to host uh, students. So we we could provide interested families and then give that to educatious, and they would work with the host families, um, and they would vet them. So that wouldn't be any burden on the school. So the school's not doing. Um, any of that type of stuff, other than getting the applications, looking at the applications, accepting students, you know, and, and maybe doing the uh, Skype. Would the school, now let me, let me ask it a different way, would the school have any say in, for example, saying yes or no to a host family, even yeah. though they're not doing their process? Um, would it, the, all, it, would, it would all depend, I think. If there was some information about a host family that would cause concerns, you would, you would bring those forward. But the, the first um, priority would be to, the best case scenario is have a Wilmington family host an exchange student. So the Wilmington families um, would be the priority and then if they couldn't find, you know, if we had 10 and we had nine Wilmington families but there was one student that we couldn't find in Wilmington, then they would go out to, you know, other districts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or Mrs. Kane? I have a question on the um, extracurricular activities, specifically in sports. Mm -hmm. I know, like we're a competitive, as everybody is in the high school. Um, 
how do they get the kids into the teams when they haven't been or if they've been here in the summer and tried out or can they try out and not make a team how does that yeah, work? yeah it's that they would follow the same and it's they they follow all the same rules you know the uh, school rules practice rules um and, and so if there was like cuts in volleyball that exchange student went off the wall they could get cut um a lot of them uh want to experience it so that they may choose the sports where there's no cuts, like uh, cross country, for example. Um, but there are some uh, students that are, are pretty good at the sports, you know. Yes. So does that mean they come in the summer? So they the would come in the summer, summer. yeah. Okay. So they would, they would, we would hopefully set all of this up. Um, and then over the summer, we'd, you know, nail down the, the host families, have the exchange, who's coming. And then when school starts, they would be ready to go in August. So when we start late August, early September, these uh, families would be ready to go. And the host families need to have a special room for the, they, I'm assuming they each get their own bedroom. Right. So yeah, so they would need like, yeah, sleep, you know, yeah. uh, just a bedroom, sleeping room. I think it's, you know, a bed and bureau. And, but that's part of uh, education is working with the host families. Yes. I'd just, I just like to say one more thing. Sure. Um, in my high school, which was only a few years ago, <laughs> um, we had an exchange student, Nalita, and oh my goodness, we all fought over her. It was, <laughs> it was such a fantastic it's, experience. Really, yeah. And then I have my children, two of them have gone to junior year abroad, and they've made lifelong friends. It's, it's fabulous. I think that American students really need to see the world and appreciate what we have here in the United States. Right. So um, I think this looks like a really important program. Great. Okay. So, thank you. Mr. Talbot. Sure. Yeah. How is this funded? So the, um, the funding, when we say the cream of the crop of, of the students coming over, usually they're um, very well, uh, it's very wealthy families, so the families are funding everything. So for that family that's sending their uh, child here for that 10 months, it's probably between 50, I would say about 45 to $55,000. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I noticed that there were a lot of the kids in, on the, the list you gave were on honor, in, on the honors uh, right. courses so and things like that. These are highly motivated uh, students that are really looking to get an American education experience in being here uh, in New England with all of the great colleges that we have, it's, a, it's very attractive for them to come here for a year. And then what typically they do is, you know, they'll be, in, you know, I mean, we have exchange students in the past, we come back to the high school. They're at BC, BU, Harvard, so. Um, Mrs. Burns. Thank you. Um, with the thought, of, with them coming in the summertime, I know, typically not in the older grades, but we've, there have been times, one instance where we've had 17 new enrolled students. Right. Would you start, is, is it the expectation if we do take this on to start off slow and then just see what the trends continue to be and um, go from there year to year or? I would yeah. anticipate, I mean, we would try to start at probably the same level that uh, Beverly High School had started, so maybe three to five students. Uh, we are in a position right now where, for the most part of the last several years, we've had declining enrollments at the high school. So, um, you know, we've we've kind of shown the list of places where some of our students go to. So, um, obviously, if we make the commitment and and we start the process and we sign all the appropriate paperwork, we are obligated. But I think, you know, given our numbers, we would continue to do enrollment projections as we do every year. But um, we would base it on that. So, if we were able to accommodate more you know, up to 10 or 12 I think that would be ideal I can't see us getting much higher than that where we are currently but I think we are well positioned because we have seen flat to declining enrollments over the last several years okay. thank okay. you any other questions no I have one I just for clarification so my understanding is this would be a total one-time cost to our district mm -hmm. of 2350 that's not per Exchange student, that's that's it. That's, that's it. it. That's okay, total. total. And then the benefit to us, if we take a student per student, what's the benefit to our district? Uh, cost wise, yes, so please. it would be uh, per pupil cost. 
Yeah. So that's around right now fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. That's what I thought you said. Yeah. Right. It's okay. based on the per pupil and reported Fuck. by DESE. So for okay. us right now, it's just just a hair below fifteen thousand. Okay. And you could add if there was fees, which which we don't have here. Um, some some schools would add an extra five hundred dollars for fees, so it could be the school district can set the fee. But we typically, the fee. minimum is you want to use your pure pupil cost. Right? Sure. So you could increase that a little bit if you sure. wanted to. Sure. And I heard you say the benefit to the host family is approximately seven and seven hundred and fifty a well, month. It's about seven hundred to eight hundred dollars a month. Okay. Um, depending, you know, okay. on the cost, but it's yeah minimum of seven hundred. Okay. And that's for the 10 months. Okay, so. and are you looking for us to take action on this this evening so that we can get this process mm -hmm. started? Are we? We feel, I mean, the only ap approval to the extent there would be approval, we wanted to bring it to your attention. It's not necessarily something other than the fact that, you know, there's a 2350 expenditure that we not haven't necessarily budgeted, but uh, in speaking with Paul, he feels that we're able to absorb that expense. So I think if the committee is okay with us making that investment to at least apply um, and begin the process, I think that's what we're looking to do. Okay, any discussion on that? So that's just that $650 fee. Is that point time visit to kind of start the process? Correct. So once we do the $1,700 application process, we become an I-20 school. That's the first step. Then they'll send out a, a team for the visit. So that's the total cost is <coughs> okay, the so combo. So it's $1,700 plus a $650 right. versus the $2350. So $2, okay, any further discussion? I'll take a motion that we move forward with this then. Okay. I'll make that motion. Mrs. Burns, a second? second okay, all those in favor? Great, unanimous. Awesome. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you. Thank you. That's exciting just, stuff. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> and I'd just like to take one moment of your time because I do talk a lot. Um, I just want to say that uh, the, the first uh, I mean, seven weeks, eight weeks, it's been, every week is, it gets better and better in the sense of the people that I meet. Um, I had the great opportunity in the beginning of school. I've been in every school. I think I went to every classroom, even took a left and went into Tewksbury by mistake. <laughs> um, I didn't visit their school, though. Um, but it was amazing. On the, some of those really hot days, I, you know, I went to the middle school, for example. I heard that. It's so hot up there, you know, on that the top floor. And so I went in there towards the end of the day, and I'm telling you, the teachers were teaching and, and the students were, I mean, it was just incredible. Because it could have been so easy for them to say, oh, you know what, let's relax, it's still too hot. And I've just been so impressed with the dedication of the staff here and the dedication of the students um, and the, the manners. And it's just been a great, great um, experience. So. Um, I think it's awesome. And then hearing those two students and that, that academic achievement is amazing. It's 1.4 uh, million students across the country take that test. And you have a commended student, which is in the top 5%, and then you have a, a semifinalist, which is in the top 1%. So I think it's like 16,000 students across the country are the 1.4, and you have two students in Wilmington that uh, have made that achievement. So. A lot to be proud of, and I just thank you guys for the opportunity, and we'll just keep working together. So that's my motivational my speech for the night. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, our next item of business is curriculum leadership and design. It seems like a perfect segue, but I, I wanted to just, this is really a point of information. Uh, you know, I think there was some discussion uh, at our last meeting um, <coughs> with respect to, uh, in, it was related to superintendent goals. Um, so I have two things. I provided the committee with uh, excerpts from an article that we actually, as a district leadership team, read at a recent district leadership team meeting when the subject of the conversation was curriculum leadership and curriculum development and working together in putting together structures and processes so that we could produce those curriculum maps finally. I know it's been a work in progress, but so we could kind of get to the, the end zone and, and obviously uh, 
Mr. Gallagher in his role as assistant superintendent for curriculum is the curriculum leader for the district. So he has the honor of taking that football and getting it, getting it over into the end zone. So I wanted to just provide you with this article because I think it was very helpful, certainly to, to our team and hopefully to you as well with respect to the curriculum leader's role. Uh, and, and Sean being the curriculum leader, there's a place in here that talks about the curriculum leader uh, having three key roles, the visionary, the gatekeeper, and the change agent. That's towards the end of the article. And, um, you know, as the visionary, as the article says, the curriculum leader needs to know where and how to lead the curriculum teams. That is the main way that we're going to move forward with our curriculum alignment. Uh, that the curriculum leader is also the gatekeeper. So this is the person, and I love this analogy, who stands in front of each building and classroom in the district and allows only effective instructional practices through the gate. Uh, it's that person's job to make sure that any program implemented aligns with the teaching and learning goals for each of our specific content areas. And finally, serving as a principal change agent responsible for identifying and determine, determining how to make these improvements. So I thought that you might like to, might enjoy reading these excerpts as well as we move forward. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm so pleased to have Sean here to do this work. Uh, I think he possesses all the qualities that are outlined in this article, and I think that we as a district <coughs> leadership team are looking forward to his leadership in advancing our curriculum and instructional initiatives. So I thought you would enjoy that. And the other piece of information that I provided to you actually on your at your places um, this evening is a document called Power Elements for Inclusive Practice, and this is uh, for superintendents. So I think I mentioned that we are focused this year on implementing our inclusive, the inclusive practices that um, you can read about in the Educator Effectiveness Guidebook for Inclusive Practices. These practices are practices that have, have been identified by our Inclusion Task Force, by our Behavioral Health Task Force, um, by our leadership team as being those areas of focus that we should uh, really establish in moving our district forward. So there are, as you can see, eight what we call power elements or power standards. And uh, in, de in developing my goals for the upcoming year, uh, many of the goals are aligned to these particular elements. There are something like 32 elements overall in the superintendent's rubric. Um, what we've also done for school level administrators and for teachers is narrow their focus by focusing on these power elements there are a lot, an aligned set for superintendent, school level administrators, and teachers. And you can see that alignment if you look at the three different uh, sets of power elements. And uh, I think what's important here is just to recognize, as the power elements indicate, that a lot of what the uh, inclusive practices envision in the, as the role of the superintendent, and this is within the rubric itself as well, is supporting administrators and supporting principals so that they can then support the work that happens at the building level. So I hadn't presented this. this I just found that they had released the superintendent. They had the school level administrator and the teacher. So as soon as I recognized that they had released this, I wanted to share it with you as well for some context on the superintendent goals, which, as you know, is on the agenda for our next meeting on October 12th for our final approval. Great. Hedy, any questions or comments? Mrs. Kane? Andrew. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, I no, feel like I'm right. playing tennis no, don't, here. Don't, don't look at here. Don't that was good. Please don't. Um, I'm, I'm just curious as to, I know we get these, and they're very, very general. But if we're making specific changes within the system um, and the way curriculum's developed or, or given um, the teachers are working through it or whatever, for instance, say lesson development support, and it says um, the establish effective strategies, et cetera, could we have a, a list of something that what we're working on to the, the changes that we're making? Do you know what I'm asking? I don't mean everything specific, but if we're making some major changes um, about the way things are happening in the department, in the, in the school? Yeah, well, at this point, the only thing that we're doing is we're not in a, a place where we're actually designing or developing any new curriculum. Uh, what we're trying to do is effectively capture what is being taught. I think 
What we lack is, I mean, all teachers have curriculum, all teachers have units that they're teaching, they have lessons that they teach as part of those units. And what we lack is the documentation of that, what's called curriculum maps with the pacing and guides and the scope and the sequence. I shouldn't say that we don't have them at all. There are some co content areas, for example, math, where K-12, we're in pretty good shape with those curriculum maps. So it's not about developing new curriculum so much as capturing exactly what we are doing so that we have those documents to provide to all of our staff so that every staff member knows exactly what it is that's being taught, the pacing, the scope, the sequence, and there's consistency across those areas. If and when there are new standards, and we haven't had any new standards since 2011, at that point, that's when you actually start to begin to develop new curriculum to align. But at this point, we're just looking to capture what we have, and then as we move forward in the curriculum renewal cycle, we will evaluate, we will evaluate data, and if we need to make changes to curriculum because the, the assessment information that we're receiving, whether it be formative, interim, or summative, that we are making those adjustments to curriculum if we're finding that our curriculum is not sufficiently addressing whatever gaps that we have. But at this stage, um, other than the fact that you know we're using different programs like Envisions, which we've shared with you, or that we're using strategies like Reader's Workshop for, uh, for literacy instruction right. um, and using the Lucy Coffin's units of studies, those are all things at this point other than um, than those, there are no sort of new kind of curricular initiatives um, okay. happening. But as they do, that's when we would actually bring those to to the committee. All right, thank you. And just one other question: um, Does I know in the past a couple of years ago we were talking about the fact that um, per DESE we were supposed to be aligning curriculum to teachers' evaluations, et cetera. Do, does any of this happen now, or is that gone? I think what you're referring to is the district determined measures, perhaps. Um, and that's actually an interesting um, point. Uh, so part of the educator evaluation system, uh, there, it, there are the summative ratings, where they're rated on the rubric as being proficient, exemplary, et cetera. And there is a, it was contemplated in the regulations, a second rating called the student impact rating and teachers were to develop these common assessments that were going to be used uh, as a measure of their impact on student learning. Uh, as it turns out, that has been a, a somewhat of a challenging uh, implementation process for all districts, mm -hmm. and the DESE recognizes that. Finally, it's taken us some time, and it's taken a lot of effort on the part of the various associations in providing that information to the DESE, showing how much of a challenge it's been. Now, we were just informed recently that the commissioner uh, had shared with us a memo that he shared with the State Board of Education where he is proposing to um, submit to them some significant changes in regulations that will likely do away with the student impact rating as it was initially contemplated, and instead will make student, will incorporate somehow measures of student learning within the rubric itself. Excellent, good, thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Burns. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the additional clarification. It was very helpful. And I just wanted to clarify that at no time do I have any reservation with you being the curriculum leader and, and sharing. I have no reservation at all. Very excited to have oh, you in district. You. I'm excited um, to I was just trying to see incorporate that, but I, I do appreciate the additional um, article that you submitted. It was a, a lot more clarifying mm -hmm. for me, yeah. and it was very helpful. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? No? Okay, great. Uh, the next item of business, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees will be having their annual convention the beginning of November, and part of that convention and conference is their annual business meeting. And the annual business meeting will take place on Wednesday, November 2nd at 315 down on the Cape. Um, they have asked us as participants to nominate our delegate to represent the Wilmington School Committee at their uh, annual business meeting. Um, so we need to do that this evening. Um, I had asked for volunteers. I think there's only a couple of us that are, are going. Um, and the one person I heard from was Mrs. Burns. So. Uh, it, either, if Ms. Bonish, I mean, she, I think you did a wonderful job last year. If you'd like to take over, it's really... 
<laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Um, and it's just my turn. <laughs> and just for the record, what happens at the the annual meeting of Massachusetts Association School Committees? Um, they ask us to act upon recommendations for life membership in the association, and they've got a couple of nominees. They ask us to elect the officers of the association. They've got a couple of nominees already, and they also ask us to consider and act upon the reports of their officers and committees, as well as the resolutions that they propose annually. And at a future meeting before November, we will be discussing those resolutions and just get a brief sense of how we feel as a community, whether we're going to support those resolutions or not. Um, so I think it's pretty easy if Mrs. Burns has volunteered and wishes to act as our, our delegate to the annual business meeting. I think there you go. Okay. <laughs> a bit of Mrs. Mrs. Kane, yes, we'll take I'll a motion. It. Mr. Talbot okay. will second it. Thank I would say all those in favor. Good job. Thank all right, you. so Thank I you. will, um, they've asked us to, to submit a form and I think we're even on time to do that. So, Mrs. Burns. Very quick question, and this question is actually posed to Mrs. Kane if she doesn't mind. Um, Division one, do you know if they're meeting any any time before the convention? No, I don't believe so. Okay, I've, I have to say a couple of years ago, I found it very helpful yeah. that they met as a group. It's not always easy to discuss the resolutions. It's been harder part. to get them together, I think, yeah. Thank you. Okay, before we move on to our next agenda item, I just wanted to say a couple of words, and that is, this is, I'm going into my fourth year as a member of this community, and I have always been very proud of how organized and efficiently we run our school committee business meetings. Um, and I think part of the reason why we are so organized and efficient and we tackle such a great deal of information is because we stick to an agenda. Uh, we have a long-standing practice of following that agenda and as we invite the public to observe us in our discussions, uh, while we do take public comments and questions, we do ask and request that they stick to agenda items. So at this point, we've come to the place where we allow for public comments. And if there's anyone here who would like to comment on our agenda, you are welcome to do so. Okay, and for the record, if you could just state your name and your address, that would be great. Thank you. So I'm David Ratzel, Arian Street. Um, and quickly, I wanted to say in light of the state accountability data being released on Monday that I wanted to quickly commend Woburn Street School and the North Intermediate School, which were named level one schools in the state accountability <coughs> system. So huzzah to them. And I also just quickly wanted to follow up on the, the superintendent's comment about the direction that uh, district determined measures have been going in the uh, educator evaluation system uh, because the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education met yesterday and they were very much in line with the commissioner's uh, presentation uh, as far as the, the difficulty of doing that and the desire to uh, change that system uh, in the way that uh, the superintendent indicated. So uh, the board was receptive to uh, the commissioner's presentation on that point. It was described by someone afterwards as the death rattle of DDMs. <laughs> <laughs> so that seems to be the direction in which that's going. Great, thank you for that information. Appreciate it. Okay. Excellent. Well, we will move on to other reports. And our, our first item, I do know there's a couple of subcommittee reports this evening. Um, but first, I'm going to ask Mrs. Bonish, who is our liaison to the Facility Master Plan Committee, and Superintendent Delay to give us an update on a meeting that took place recently. Um, well, there wasn't a lot on the schools that night. It was okay. mostly on the um, town side. They talked about feedback that they got from different people around town um, about some of the plans that, the initial plans. And um, there's, there's gonna be a couple more meetings coming up that they're gonna split up between the school side and the town side and really get down to making some decisions about this document. So, and I believe that, um, and Mary, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there's an extra meeting on November 3rd, which they're going to do the town side because Correct. some people are going to the 
uh, this MASC the conference. conference. Correct. And then the other one it, it, it would be October 20th October or the one 20th. afterwards? Okay. So the October 20th one would be the one that is going to focus on the schools and the different um, uh, setups of the changes, the possible changes of schools. And that meeting, yeah, they're going to do, they're, they're in the process right now of actually doing the analysis of the evaluation of the alternatives. Remember, you narrowed down those alternatives from eight, I think, that were originally proposed down to five. So they will, they're, they've commenced their analysis, and their intent is to provide some of the details of that analysis for school buildings on October 20th. And as, as Mrs. Bonish mentioned, the town buildings on November 3rd. They originally, I think it makes sense to split it anyway because it's a lot to cover, yeah. and it just so happened that most of us <laughs> weren't going to be able to make the, the November 3rd meeting which if they had done that one. So October 20th at 6 o'clock, the earlier start time is to accommodate what is anticipated to be a wealth of information, and it will be in this room as well. Okay. I think it would be really helpful if as many of us from the school committee as possible could attend because this does affect our school buildings, of which we have some oversight. Um, will they be still using this document that we just? Is this, I don't believe this, this is may the not final be. one, no. Okay. There is a document. We actually didn't have the latest copy. I missed the meeting in June, which they gave out the, the latest copy. And I haven't received another one since, but I might just request one okay. just for the purpose of having it in front of me. Right. Because we didn't have it in front of us. but. Um, Similar to this, but there okay. were a couple of changes. Okay, and I think they'll they'll give a full analysis of what the different what the expenses, what the cost mm -hmm. would be, mm -hmm. what the potential savings would be. They actually developed a matrix of criteria that they will evaluate, and then actually asked us to give input on the weighting of those criteria. So, uh, is it more important? Are the fiscal aspects more important than say? you know, the compliance with modern educational standards, and is that more important than, say, minimizing transitions? So they asked, they had a whole list of criteria, it's probably about 20 or 25 criteria yeah. with some weightings, and so they will use that system to help to prioritize, if you will, mm -hmm. those options, and once they apply the weightings and, and evaluate the criteria, their hope is that sort of some, it will prioritize so that the top option will float to the top. So they will present all of the individual evaluations for the options and also the overall matrix that they use to kind of prioritize those options. Mrs. Prince. Uh, well, Mr. Helby um, at that meeting on he the 20th as well? Okay. The entire um, facility master plan committee, I believe, will, will be there other okay. than those that might not be able to make that. In addition, I just wanted to add that on October 12th, uh, myself and the town manager and Mr. Gatchel from the CISO group who does the educational facilities planning are going to be taping an episode of In the Loop uh, moderated by our own director of technology, Anne-Marie Fiore. And uh, the, the purpose of that is to explain to the community what the facility master plan was, what it's all about, what are the uh, options being proposed for schools, how did we come to choose those alternatives? What's the process moving forward? What's, what are the opportunities for com community input? Mm -hmm. And uh, how, does, how do we see this plan being used in the future? So it's a 30 minute episode, so we can only pack so much in. But our goal is to do that and have that air prior to the October 20th meeting so that any member of the public who is interested will have some background and context to be able to participate in that meeting. Okay, great. Any questions or comments? I'll look left this time. <laughs> no? No? Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. And I think, uh, Mrs. Burns, you had said you wanted to comment on the Wellness Committee? Yep. We okay. met for our first meeting last Wednesday. I wrote a little blurb so that I could try to stick to the point point, keep it um, efficient. Um, as I said, the Wellness Advisory Committee had its first meeting last Wednesday. And I have to say that all the me members are very enthusiastic to start the New Year's work. Um, and I have to commend the facilitators for creating such a positive and, and very engaging environment um, in which to promote creative uh, thinking on the tasks at, at hand for this upcoming year. Um, I think this approach will lend itself to some fantastic goal setting for the upcoming year within our schools. Uh, 
Doreen Crow brought both new and old members up to speed on where we were on the Essential School Health Services Grant, which we are entering our ninth year. Um, through this grant, Wilmington has helped implement and mentored health Init initiatives in the Burlington and Woburn school systems, which are doing quite well with their, uh, their new um, initiatives. We touched upon the continuous quality improvement project in which we're waiting, still waiting for the state to determine the guidelines of which to fulfill. I'm not quite, um, I think, don't quite understand completely the details of that aspect. But um, Laura Stinson discussed the school health index and offered thoughts on possible goals for this year, such as a walking school bus, which is getting the kids out and moving and walking bus routes, uh, which I thought was pretty creative, um, and where students would, um, and creating increased activity during indoor recess time, um, especially during the winter months. Um, and continuation of a theme, lunches in all the schools. Um, I guess they have taco, like it's similar to a Taco Tuesday, and they have each week is a different theme, which I think is really kind of um, a healthy theme, I should say, which is really kind of, capturing the kids' interests. Um, it, it comes under our um, Healthy Kids, Better Students initiatives, um, which have been successful, especially in the Woburn School. Um, the Shawshine had smarter lunchrooms, and Woburn Street have move, had movement in the morning, where before the start of school with everyone in their classrooms, the kids would have movement time. I think someone will get over the speaker and play some music, and everyone moves, which I think is a great way of getting the kids' energy out and getting them focused for the day's work ahead. Um, to generate ideas for this year's goals, uh, we were asked to read an excerpt from an article entitled Whole School, Whole Child, and Whole Community, uh, which we then highlighted those areas of the text that we identified strongly to um, in the education of children. Some of the texts that struck me were each child in each school in each of our communities deserves to be healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged, as well as the development of the whole child is more than the acquisition of knowledge or skills, behavior, or character. It is all these. Um, it's a take a, takes the village approach to um, healthy children and um, academic achievement. Um, from this discussion, we're just starting to lay the foundation of um, the process of determining and shaping the health goals for our schools and possible initiatives um, for the upcoming year. So, but I have to say it was such an engaging um, subcommittee that the time flew by and I just enjoyed the, everyone's company and enthusiasm in that. So um, that's pretty much it. And if there's any questions, I shall do my best to answer. I had meant to reach out to Ms. Uh, Doreen Crow just to make sure I was on point and that I captured everything you know, well to report back to you guys. So Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions? No? Okay, and I think Mrs. Kane, you wanted to fill us in on the latest CPAC. Yes, the um, CPAC started the year on Monday night, and um, they had a basic rights workshop, which is very informative. They begin every year with that, and uh, very interesting. I would just like to say, I, ho I would hope that um, more, more parents in town realize the benefit <coughs> of this CPAC organization. They have so much to offer, and um, they're wonderful people. They always ha have a really um, pointed uh, explanation of what they're going to be talking about and what they're doing. They bring in people for workshops that are really important to the, their children, um, to everyone's children. And um, they have a wonderful little brochure, the um, CPAC brochure, and tells you what their mission and vision <coughs> is, the vision to make a difference for students and families. And I really think they do because they, they are educating the public. Um, sponsored parent workshops, they have this whole long list of the workshops they've had just last year. And then they have their accomplishments over here. And they work together with the school system to bring things that are of special benefit for the special needs students in our schools. And so um, I would just like to recommend that people contact them through the website and it would be http uh, colon slash slash <laughs> wpsk12.com slash resources slash CPAC. And um, you'd be totally welcome. They have business meetings. The next one is going to be on um, October 13th. And their business meetings are at 6.30 in the high school library right down the hall here. 
and they're very welcoming and they would I would love to see they would love to see more people involved because the more ideas you have the more you can accomplish but for parents of um, kids with special needs I cannot tell you what a support this group is they're very open to new people and um, so I hope that other people will think about it and start to um, pay more attention to the fact that we have this available to them and it's really worthwhile so um, I'll be bringing you updates as we go along. Excellent. But thank October you. 13th, it would be great to see people there. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank Any you. questions? Any other subcommittee reports? No? Great. Thank you. All right. I think we're on to correspondence, Mrs. Bonish. Nothing. Great. All right. Future meeting dates and agenda items on October 12th, same time, same place. And then October 26th, and I, it's so hard to believe we're talking about October. But those are our next two future meetings. All right, and with that, I will call for a motion to adjourn. Mrs. Bonish. Mrs. Burns, second. All those in favor? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it.